Please be seated. Sunday, second Sunday of Lent. So here we are, just starting. But it was kind of an odd way for us to start because on the first Sunday of Lent, we had baptisms and confirmations and receptions and reaffirmations. So it was like all about how fun and bringing people into the community, right? Right around, and as we start off Lent, right? And so we're like, now like, aren't we supposed to be like, oh, it's me, this is terrible. I'm a terrible person. Please, Lord, forgive me, right? But meanwhile, we started off with this, all these wonderful things around receptions, right? And bringing people into our community. And so I was thinking about the passage for today, particularly in the passage that we read with Mark, I was like, oh, there's an interesting phrase that I had not paid attention as closely in the past. So just to ground us as to where we are in scripture, we are seated right in between, in the gospel, not in our Lenten series, not in our liturgical season, but in the scripture itself, we're seated right in between two bookends. And on one end, which we don't read, is Peter's proclamation that Jesus is the human one, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God incarnate. And after what we read is the transfiguration. So these are the two bookends for this particular uh, part of scripture that we read in the Gospel of Mark. And so here, after Peter says, you are the one, you are God incarnate, Jesus begins to teach. And what does he teach? The human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and the legal experts, and be killed. And that's usually kind of where I stop the listening. Because I'm like, that's hard enough. I'm like, whoa, that's a lot to take in. But this next phrase is what I want to focus on. Because Jesus continues. And then, after three days, rise from the dead. And I think that's key for us. Because Jesus is teaching the disciples about taking up their cross. Those who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them, right? Here's the thing, is that Jesus is saying this suffering, this cross, is for eternal life. It's for joy. It's for a kind of world and a kind of life that I want for you, that I was willing to die for you so that you wouldn't suffer, right? And so that's, I think, important for us to remember that what kind of suffering is Jesus talking about? What does he mean by suffering? What is he talking about? Because often this phrase has been used to keep people down, particularly people of lower means, people with lower, with less power, women, right? Oh, I would hear in my family, maybe you've never heard this, maybe this concept of suffering and the cross has not been used, you haven't heard it used in very negative ways, but I remember hearing people, my family and my grandmother are saying, well, that's just her cross. You know, that's her cross to bear. And usually what her cross to bear was, oh, I'm hearing, I'm seeing some nod from the women in the a bad marriage, abusive marriage, poverty, bad wages, right? People being exploited. Oh, that's just the bear, the cross to bear. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about taking up your cross for love 
taking up your cross for life-giving things, taking up your cross for things to get better for you and for your community. That's what Jesus is talking about. Because remember, the cross for Jesus turned into resurrection, turned into eternal life, turned into conquering evil, right? That's the cross that Jesus took on. And that's the cross that Jesus is inviting us to take on. How are we to take on that cross for each of us depends on our situation, on our context, on the time in history that we are living, in the times at hand, presently, today. That's what we need to discern. And so what are we living, how are we living in a way that is not life-giving? How are we living, how are we being in a way that puts a barrier between us and God's love, between us and, God, and the love for others? That's the question, I think. And if we think of, I am so sorry. I'm trying really hard here. Maybe if I just stay really quiet still. You know, that's, that is my cross to bear, to be still so that others can listen, right? See, there it is, right? It may be uncomfortable for me to do something that is not natural and normal for me to do, but I've got to discern what is better for me and for others, not just for me, right? And sometimes what we do is not even good for us, right? And I think that's what I want to invite you to. How can the teaching of Jesus today help us during the time of Lent? So that we're not thinking, oh, I am so bad. I've got to just change all of me because I'm just so bad and yucky. And, and I, you know, how could God possibly love me this way? So I just got to change everything about me. That's not the point. Over and over and over, we've heard Jesus say, God loves you. God wants the best for you. God wants abundant life for you and for your community. And so then our job is to discern and an invitation during Lent is to ask ourselves, how, what could we do differently? What disciplines could I take on? What things could I stay away from to help me into and enter into that eternal life now? today. And what does that mean, right? How am I getting closer and being drawn near to God and to my brothers and sisters and not further away? We have this beautiful image, comical image, of the bishop talking about how she was dragging, you know, how that man was dragging that, that dog and the dog was pulling away from the owner of the dog. And so during Lent, how can we draw closer? How can we draw near? Dwell a little closer to God. Not because we are bad, but because God wants more and better and bigger for us today. And sometimes that is suffering. Let me tell you, it is suffering for me when I have to say no to delicious carbs, <laughs> right? It is a hard one for me. Ooh, don't even get me in front of my mother's flour tortillas, because forget it. <laughs> and I'm about to get to Laredo in a couple of weeks, and so I'm just already thinking about how am I going to do this. Not because the tortillas are bad. They're made with love. And should I shun them? No, I need to eat them but eat them in a measured way, right? So that they then don't turn to harm, right? Because I want to live a healthy life, right? So that I'm, I can continue to enjoy life. And so for some of us, it may mean, you know, I haven't been taking very good care of my body. And so I need to figure out how do I do that? For some of us, it may mean I may be numbing my body 
because I don't want to deal with the pain and the grief that I have in my life. And so I numb it through food, through alcohol, through exercise. There's lots of things we can numb our body with, right? Because we're afraid to encounter and to suffer that grief. But then we don't allow that grief to turn into understanding and into that, what is it, the tears, the sorrow into dancing, that transformation that can happen by dwelling in that grief and then growing out of that grief into a resurrected life. Maybe I'm just holding on too tight and I have to feel like I've got to do everything because if I don't do it, it ain't going to get done. And so I don't trust in the Sabbath. I don't trust in rest. I don't trust in letting go. I don't trust in that creator, creator of all. And I don't trust in my neighbors to pick up the slack because maybe they won't do it just like I want them to. Or maybe they won't do it in the timeline that I think it needs to be done. I mean, as parents, OMG. Oh, if we could control how our children did their, lived their lives, everybody would be happier, right? There would be no problems. Oh, but they have a mind of their own. Hmm. Maybe I could trust a little more in God to help them in their journey as God helped me along in my journey. I offer this to you all to think about how can the teachings of Jesus in this concept of suffering and cross not be a negative, not be a, a real sense of shadow and darkness, but as a way to say what are things that I need to change in my life because I want that eternal life now. And what do I gain? What do I gain if I give this up? What do I gain if I start doing this difficult thing? Right? That's Jesus' invitation. And that's what he says to them. And then, after three days, rise from the dead. You, too, are invited for a resurrected life. You too are invited for this life-giving life that Jesus was willing to give up for us. Amen. Amen.